Thank you all very much for coming. Can the, does the mic work in the back? Can you guys hear that? Okay, cool. My name is Simon Boussier. I'm an assistant professor of landscape architecture and urban design here at CAP. And as uh, the coordinator of the lecture series for the Department of Landscape Architecture, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you and our guest, Ms. Julie Bargman. Uh, Bargman started Dirt Studio in 1992 to research, design, and build projects with passion and rigor. Born and raised in New Jersey, Julie is forthright and unafraid to provoke debate in order to tease out what matters most about places, especially those that bring to mind post-industrial issues and attributes of the Garden State. Her background in sculpture influences the use of fundamental forms and gestures that present themselves on a site, whether in plain view or discovered by peeling back layers of history. Julie's adventurous design approach informs her role as chair and professor of landscape architecture at the University of Virginia, where she leads investigations with students into fallow terrain, imagining renewed sites of cultural and ecological production. Julie earned a, math, a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree at Carnegie Mellon University and a Master of Landscape Architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. She's received the Rome Prize Fellowship from the American Academy in Rome and the National Design Award from Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt Museum. Julie's projects span more than two decades uh, at DIRT and have received numerous awards, including a 2014 Honor Award from the American Society of Landscape Architects. Her work has been featured in art and design exhibi exhibitions, including Documenta and the National Design Centennial. She lectures frequently at universities, conferences, and cultural institutions, which have ranged from the Museum of Modern Art to National Brownfields meetings. Time, CNN, and Newsweek, as well as national and international design publications, have recognized Julie as a leading uh, pioneer in the next generation of making a difference for design in the built environment. Uh, as a kid who likes to make things and being from a former mill town myself, I became really interested in Julie's work through Mass Mocha first uh, in Western Massachusetts. I was an undergraduate sculpture student visiting the Museum of Contemporary Art there uh, on the grounds of this super complex former factory site that had you know, evolved over generations of different technologies and manufacturing uh, issues. And that, that super complex uh, site in North Adams, Massachusetts, I, I recall s sort of feeling overwhelmed by all those different generations of productions and all the layers of this new, big, cool art that was infused with dynamic human uses. And it, it felt so, sort of schizophrenic at first or just like totally loaded with too much information, but it soon really gelled and it threw me into a really good place seeing landscape as a creative outlet for one's art, as a media itself, as indistinguishable from the built structures, and that fusion made a big impression on me as, a, as an early student. More recently, we've been following DIRT's projects along the East Coast where form is there, things are made, but not simply as a projection of outer beauty uh, or of just sort of ecological technology, like so much of the field today, which unknowingly continues a, a pictorialist tradition of recreating pastoral images through pretty rigid or predetermined infrastructures or strategies. The features of Julie's work instead emerge from a heavily process-based and site-dependent design model that foregrounds cultural, performative, and productive issues. And it really asks good, super good questions, deeply reading into phenomenological situations and informing a real dialogue with sites. She asks great questions like, what about this place right here is calling us? What forms or structures should the landscape take you know, for a chunk of time? Who will engage in that structure? what will be made here to reimagine the next course of action. And because we've inherited such a complex landscape, because so much of the work that extends conventional narratives of design either camouflages, uh, disperses, or completely strips a place of its ecological and cultural heritage, it's so important to ask the sorts of good questions that Julie is asking. This is why we've brought you here today, uh, to perhaps give us your perspective and in doing so, I think, um, open us up about some of the issues that we face here in, in Muncie, Indiana in the context of the Rust Belt, in the context of this really incredibly rich post-industrial landscape. I appreciate Julie's working of form, amplifying muted features, revealing the inconspicuous beauty of a site's working traces, and finding dynamic associations for people with the land, and in the service of human experience as well as ecological processes. In making work that really understands the nature and the problems of our time, she has transformed our discipline in the world around us. We're very lucky to have you here with us today. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ms. Julie Bartman. Thank 
you, Simon, very much. Uh, it's really nice, um, really great to be here. And um, first thing is I've debated uh, the title of the, um, of the lecture. And of course, one was I wanted to have it be No Sissy Landscapes, which of course I believe in wholeheartedly. Uh, but then in talking with Simon, um, we talked about how, how about simply telling war stories, um, which I have plenty of, on, and I have a lot of bruises and scars probably to show for um, trying hard to stay grounded and um, look to see how ideas can get into the ground um, without being compromised. Uh, but I'm talking about not egotistical ideas of ours. I'm, I'm talking about the ideas that come from the landscape itself and from the people that depend on that landscape, the, the ones that are human and non-human um, who work and live and die there. Um, and uh, I want to charge all of you to remember that you are the guide. Um, you, all of you in the Allied Design Arts and Plan are the voice you know, of the landscape and when communities are really baffled about all the complexity of, um, around us, you really are, I think, obligated, charged and obligated to help them through that complexity because we certainly are surrounded by it. You just simply look at a series of maps like this and realize that there is plenty of work for us to do. Um, and we realize that um, there's a lot of work to do environmentally, but there's also a lot of work to be done culturally um, and through the um, perspective and expectations of folks that um, we will be working with. And to remember that industry to us to this day um, even though we know about environmental edu uh, inv uh, regulations that are actually uh, probably younger than a lot of people in this audience having come into play um, uh, um, or into uh, law in the 1970s. So this belching smoke and all was still, um, uh, is still the symbol of U.S. pride. And um, we really are still up against people that I uh, think this is business as usual. In my work, um, there is a whole generation of folks, and yes, sometimes it's age dependent, sometimes it's not, who actually are sometimes in denial, but are really um, resistant to taking ownership of uh, the mess that they um, have made. Um, and also, a lot of folks, when you talk about these landscapes, and how to embrace them, uh, which is like telling them to hug the ugly duckling, right, or the beast. Um, they really simply want it to go away. Um, and we will, and I have, gotten a lot of pressure to simply uh, paint an artificially green pastoral image. So I would say that our practices really need to trespass. Um, trespass into a different way of working um, for a few reasons um, and a few ways to work with these tough sites um, as we find them in a very authentic way, you know, good, bad, and ugly, from intensely contaminated sites to some that are just downright degraded. Um, and I think the other charge we have is to invent very cheap and cheerful ways um, to reinvent them, that we really do need to be re, uh, resourceful. Uh, we really, many municipalities and many uh, communities simply don't have the money uh, to um, redevelop. Um, I'll go into that in a little bit. And to always, 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 the third thing, thing is to remember who cares. Um, I'm a terrible critic at school once in a while when students will be presenting their work and I'll look up and say, who cares? Um, and I'm being a bit of a jerk, but I'm also literally meaning who cares 
about who will benefit um, and become the stewards, actually, um, after we're long gone um, uh, as designers. And remember that as designers, we are very, very synthetic thinkers, that we can help those municipal agencies and margin marginalized communities find a way. Just remember to stay grounded. So design cannot be a luxury, and we really can't afford simplistic engineered solution solutions. We actually need to take jobs away from the engineers, period. Um, and insist on more of a holistic approach that doesn't avoid the complexity but actually embraces taking it on. So you can really show what's possible, not get someone that constantly says no instead of yes. Um, design is not a bunch of pretty green objects. It's messy. It's usually a pile of very terrible beauty here in Evanston, Wyoming. These degraded landscapes are not vacant. They are full. They are full of human agency. They are cultural landscapes, as, in, as important as any monument we would see in Washington, DC. Yet again, we have to resist the greenwashing uh, to remain genuine to these places, to work with the rich layers of history, um, and uh, chart a course uh, for very productive transformation. Now, the emphasis here in terms of the way in which I'm talking about working uh, is casting a course of action and that that is the primary act of design. That the working methods are very, very precise, but the formal results are completely provisional. That's a lot to ask, sorry. So in a systems-based approach, a proposal is just not a designed thing in itself, okay? It's not just the thing. Um, but it's more about a catalytic uh, process to know, to let the communities know what they can do. And to do this, you need to stay grounded. Um, derelict and degraded landscapes can appear empty and formless. Um, but they are full of histories, again, looking closely. Um, the emphasis here is on finding. Our role as designers is finding what I, what I often call site forensics. And the imperative here is recognizing and working with um, cycles of growth and decay. So here is a fact, right? An infamous mess called Detroit with people fleeing these shrinking cities. Fiction, pure fiction. I'll let you read the name. That these post-industrial shrunken cities have the money to redevelop vast abandoned acres with green industry, with shiny com commerce, and happy housing. These are not watercolor lessons. This is me on the phone with an environmental engineer and an environmental lawyer trying to hash out a deal of how to deal with um, a incredibly contaminated but factory with a beautiful view in uh, Ithaca, New York. So it is a tough exercise doing your homework to stay at the table with these guys who are doing their best to lose you. Still folks, you know, are, uh, are trying to help you uh, sweep all of this stuff under the rug and not acknowledge that this stuff is, for better and for worse, a part of that site. It is that, ma it is that mess you have to, f and in that mess you have to find the good. It demands patience and careful looking and that again, we must remain st grounded and steadfast. I think the most joyous thing about having, um, about, um, having started Dirt Studio, a very, very tiny studio, not an office, 
is all of the incredible interdisciplinary uh, collaborations that I've had in working on uh, such awesome things like acid mine drainage. This is acid mine drainage in southwestern uh, Pennsylvania in the coal country and what you see there is that iron um, substance called yellow boy killing everything in sight but hosting one of the most exotic uh, species of algae. Um, it's pretty fun to learn about this stuff and then work with it and not be so afraid of it. Uh, so in both practice and teaching, you know, the collaboration is with engineers, nice ones that say yes instead of no, with scientists, with architects, with artists and historians, every and any expertise that you need to understand a very complex um, yet simple process like the treatment for acid mine drainage. Uh, these four um, images show actually how the unstable aqueous solution, I was told not to call it water by the engineer, but the unstable aqueous, aqueous <laughs> I can't even say it anymore, aqueous solution uh, would go through a passive treatment system and indeed become biologically rich water. So. I've had the privilege of teaching a generation of students who have been patient enough for allowing me to contaminate them. And so I'm going to be showing, um, I kind of like to think that's us, us at Dirt Studio. I've actually donned this kind of uh, equipment. It's extremely claustrophobic. Uh, but I'm going to be showing a group of projects um, uh, built and I have to say the majority of them not built. So I will be showing you a, a lot of times when I've um, quit projects or um, been fired. So um, with pleasure, as you can see by that shit, uh, shit grin. So uh, in three parts. One, depending on site. Uh, decades ago, my hero, still hero, always hero, artist Robert Smithson advocated the realization that landscape is process. He was saying this long before any of us. And that the physical stuff that we make and see is merely a reflection of those processes. And this means that we need to understand these processes. I mean, we're, we kind of talk about that a lot now, but you have to understand that a few decades ago, no one was talking about this at all. Um, and that now it's pretty damn wonderful that we are talking about these processes, that we're working with all sorts of software and modeling to really be getting a handle on how it is that we can interweave our work and our pr propositions by working with them. And it is um, about not going beyond being site specific, right, which was the buzzword back in the 70s for these um, uh, earthwork artists, environmental artists, but um, actually, uh, Simon, as you said, about the work becoming site dependent, meaning the work comes up from here. It comes up from here. It does not come from there. And as uh, the other uh, guru of site-specific art and site-dependent art, um, Robert Irwin, with his um, amazing uh, seminal uh, book here, Being in Circumstance. So a few, quest a few, a few um, projects where I attempted to get at this idea about um, looking carefully and be, um, having the work dependent upon the site. Um, uh, this is uh, Turtle, I'm from Ohio originally, so I say Crick. Do you say Crick out here? Sorry, Creek Waterworks uh, in uh, Dallas, uh, Texas. And as you can see uh, on this beautiful limestone um, waterway. Um, and it really was this complete anomaly uh, in a very affluent uh, neighborhood, Highland Park in Dallas where you know, there were McMansions all over the place and the client could have easily torn down um, uh, this waterworks that you can see um, strategically placed there. It was the su um, supply for all of the fresh water of Highland Park. Well, imagine coming to a site, here, try again, sorry, 
in finding this. I mean, holy Toledo. I mean, all you could do was, would mess up, you know. You could really, I mean, I kind of said, well, what do, you know, I, I don't need to do anything here. It, it's, it's good just as is. Although I realized that I had come, um, I had come uh, to the rescue of the site, the wonderful, wonderful client um, who I'm going to quote, uh, so excuse my mouth, but I couldn't believe this gorgeous, you know, 70-something-year-old woman called me and she, and she said, Julie, could you come here fast? I think my architect's fucking up. And I said, okay, Dee Dee, I'm on my way. Um, to someone who uh, wanted to uh, sandblast uh, these beautiful walls and fill that tank with uh, turf. Uh, because that's what they would want in Dallas for their parties. I was like, excuse me? I don't think so. So my strategy was, um, was about um, pull it, really accentuating these incredible volumes in that landscape, those crazy, crazy tanks, by actually taking the creek landscape and pulling it up the landscape of a park, the street, and um, Dee Dee's house next door, and just accentuating uh, those volumes. This is one of my extremely manic sketches. Um, and simply preserving, not allowing this water filter to be taken away, that was the act of design. I didn't design that. My design act was to curate the site and have that stay. Uh, the water filter. And then all I did uh, was ask if the plumbing could be turned back on. So um, now the water f uh, fountain was a water feature or a fountain. And these were the walls that the um, uh, previous uh, uh, designer on the job wanted to uh, sandblast uh, down to the concrete. And for me, wow, I just was like, you know, talk about robbing the site of its history. Um, you could even see um, around the line there, the, the water line of the fresh water that went to Highland Park. And again, I was like, well, could we just turn the water back on? And they said, sure. Um, and then what this was about is what I'm getting ready for there is um, my clients my cli client's request to have um, barefoot tuxedo parties. So it's pretty darn cute. Um, and then the other strategy was um, the ins my insistence that uh, with a, an incredible progressive client who could have afforded anything uh, to not allow anything to go off site. So we um, Jack hammered up, the, uh, up all the concrete, and then we reconfigured it uh, within the garden uh, throughout, any garden spaces throughout. Uh, this one next to the water filter. Um, again, uh, just simply using that instead of imported granite. Um, and then you have very happy things happen um, when you simply do things like in, uh, install a fogging, uh, water misting um, uh, system for the native um, plants that Dee Dee requested. Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, um, this is uh, the Urban, um, Urban Outfitters uh, corporate campus um, at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. As you, and as you can see, it's on axis uh, with bro on, along Broad Street, Broad Street to downtown Philadelphia. Um, it's the oldest Navy Yard in the United States, so um, it's actually quite a humbling, humbling exercise. <laughs> to work on um, a landscape that important and that old. Um, uh, it, in fact, has a history of being um, an island uh, that some uh, got filled in to atta attach it to the mainland. 
Um, and to this day, I'm finding Broad Street. That's Broad Street. And to this day, you drive in, and that sleep basin is still there. If any of you drive over 95, um, and the bridge right over there, you can see the entire Navy Yard. Half of the Navy Yard is still active, and half isn't. It's so cool to see all the designers from anthropology right next to battleships. I'm sorry, I love that. Um, and, but this is what it looks like. And again, this is what someone else thinks it looks like. Okay? Do you see a trace of the Navy Yard? I don't. So, a reminder, Bob, this is what you're working with. So there's the central core. Um, since then, they're on phase four, um, where they've taken over this building. Thank you for everybody that's building, uh, buying a lot of things at Urban Outfitters and Anthropology. I uh, appreciate it. I always walk by there and say, bye, bye, bye. Um, my fee, my fee, my fee. Uh, uh, but beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, buildings of pr uh, production, um, uh, and that is dry dock number uh, number one uh, that you'll be seeing comes into play, and Broad Street coming down um, into it. Um, and what I I try to advocate that instead of a master plan, right, which is often these watercolor fait compli, right and painting this kind of impossible pretty picture. I um, often will re, uh, re, um, refer to what we do with uh, folks as an action plan. Um, and what you see here, um, sorry it's pixelated, uh, is a sketch that I'm, I'm sitting next to um, uh, Dick Hayne, the founder of Urban Outfitters, who was an incredibly active participant. I mean, we co-designed this. Um, Actually, for better and for worse, Dick is rather headstrong, but then again, so am I, so we got along quite well. Um, and, but it was this incredible back and forth. You can see us talking to one another and deciding what this place wanted to be. I came with no master plan. I came with scribbles about, I was talking to students about building their own base plan we had built a plan, you know, we had done site forensics, and I came and I said, Dick, I've got a few ideas, you know, one mostly about the rail lines um, orchestrating and organizing the site. So how do you do those site forensics? You look really hard at historic photos. We check this place out, you guys. I mean, how beautiful is this? You see the extra wide? you know, tracks there and that giant machine, so that's the crane way. You see these other tracks swooping around. You just get cues of the scale of the building. I especially looked over here because lo and behold, you go to the site and this is what you find, right? But then you look and you find this. Sweeping, sweeping into the building. Guess what those are? Rail tracks. I got obsessed with them and began this idea of just taking away and looking underneath that veneer of asphalt to be looking for the embodied energy. And I'm talking about embodied en energy in terms of human agency, uh, including Ju Judy Garland. Uh, coming and singing to the troops and wondering, uh-oh, I hate that. Is it going to start over? How does it go back on? I draw by hand, that's all I can say. Um, and I just thought, you know, how, how wonderfully ironic it is to, you know, to see this image of outfitting a, a Navy man and um, the staff of three people um, having at it. Um, and one thing, too, that I've always um, 
have to remind myself and others working on sites like this is scale, 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 scale. There's such a tendency to want to domesticate these sites, but imagine, you know, these literally outside their buildings are their, these aircraft carriers and the uh, jets flying um, into uh, Philly. So there it is, once in a while you see the beauty of these uh, tracks emerging. Um, you, took, let, you look at more um, historic uh, um, drawings to see what you can't see underneath. And then you begin to do, right back here actually is a trench that I had them dig so that like an archaeologist, you could, we could anticipate what was underneath there. And I knew we had some pretty fantastic concrete slabs. Um, and this was about, this series about it, uh, is about having to re-educate the contractor. So my little X's on the ground there is telling uh, the operator where to jackhammer um, and where uh, to um, grab a hold of the biggest pieces of concrete that they could because they were the precious um, uh, building uh, materials for the, for the site. Um, and this is me um, ta teaching uh, the crew how to uh, put in um, the giant concrete slabs carefully around trees. Um, and then, of course, you had to brand it. And in fact, it was the workers who um, were, I couldn't understand them. They were talking um, in Spanish. Um, and someone translated to me that they were talking about the Flintstones um, and that they were calling this Barney Rubble. So, so there we go. Barney Rubble was, was born. Um, and then all of that was about increasing the porosity of the site. I think we did by, you know, 200, uh, 200 percent. So that the area between buildings 15 and 12 became kind of the central, sorry, uh, campus. Um, with, uh, I thought the juxtaposition of proofy cherry trees was kind of funny um, in this industrial landscape. Um, a woman at Free People told me that she was 25% happier when the cherry trees were in bloom. I thought that was nice. Um, and there's a future designer. Um, and again, I don't think that I could have designed these pieces you know, of clearly someone in the Navy drilling those holes, um, more contemporary, someone painting an uh, asphalt stripe, and um, uh, someone's uh, working work boot making that imprint. Again, it was about finding this stuff, about curating it, and just, as I say often, loving on it. Work with um, a palette that is just simply wild and woolly, um, and adoring it in its um, in its what other people would call ugly state, but pretty gorgeous, I think. Um, and using really pretty typical industrial details. This is called the dock edge uh, that's used for loading docks, um, and actually a lot of uh, bricks, uh, bricks came out of building 18, so since she was the redhead of the family, this got nicknamed Wilma. Um, and then you see uh, Dan Burt, a uh, landscape contractor here, looking at our stockpile um, of material um, and just really digging that, you know, he has this new crazy landscape architect that likes this stuff. So um, when it wasn't big enough, we hatched yet another member of the family, um, and we calculated how much of this material could be used around, and the smaller stuff became Betty. So, um, and Betty rubble uh, was the mulch used at the bottom of hedgerows that were along the west side of the buildings to, you know, for solar gain and for water collection, just hundreds and hundreds of, of feet long with uh, native um, trees that are now way over the rooftops and finally shading uh, the offices. And again, um, when we came back at phase two, looking again at the main dry dock 
how gorgeous is that thing that used to hold these giant ships. Talk about site histories. I look at the dry duck and I just quiver thinking about this image. Um, and there it is. Thank God. Most sites, they take the um, railroad tracks off for scrap. But um, I guess the Navy didn't need to do that. So we were blessed with these tracks. Um, and then uh, simply, again, uh, nothing really to design. Um, just captured the uh, crane way. Um, and these other tracks that were already uh, arabesquing around. Uh, my homage, my homage to Robert Irwin um, or uh, Richard Serra, you name them, my heroes, um, in finding these arabesques of the rail lines and simply projecting uh, them up. And there they are in spring and they become kind of everyday runways for the spring collection. There's opening day. Um, here's a happy day. And then uh, we, I found another thing in that uh, Dick Hain came back from Paris and he said, I found this thing called these floating islands, you know, these floating wetland things, you know. And he said, you know, these are it. And I said, but Dick, they're butt ugly. You know, and he was like, yeah, I know, but like, what can we do with them? So I couldn't help myself. The whore in me just had to spell it out. <laughs> what a slut. But I just was like, okay, I'm just going to let it rip. So here they are, right in the dry dock, you know, uh, USS Urban floating in the dry dock, blooming in the first year because of, guess what, everything in the river. We couldn't believe it. I thought it was going to look like hair transplants for about three years, but no. But no, it grew so well that it is visible when you fly into Philadelphia. Oh boy. So anyway. I gained a little bit for advertisement. Um, actually, um, uh, I have to say, admit in the past year that the islands did so well because of the nutrients in the water there that they sank. It's pretty funny, actually, <laughs> that the USS Urban sank. So. Um, but really, really, when it comes down to it, this is probably my favorite image. Um, that quiet time that, as I was telling the students, this is, this is a sweet spot. Uh, two, setting in motion. Um, decades and decades ago, the, the, there was this idea of landscape processes, you know, if landscape architects finally caught on um, to um, what Robert Smithson was talking about. But, um, I believe that they became very stylized by landscape architects like George, um, and the, I, I would argue that they did not stay grounded, that they were an imposition of form, that they weren't coming from the actual processes of that landscape itse itself. Um, and so again, let's take another lesson from Robert Smithson in his piece here, Asphalt Rundown. So to ask, how does design set some things in motion without overly manipulating with what's, what's there? So um, the choreography here, I mean, you know, this, this can look very, very accidental and really kind of weird. Granted, it maybe is. But the choreography here is exact. But again, the outcome is just a calculated guess. And that's the beauty of this piece and the, the life within it. Oops, I did again. Yep. So this, um, a few projects um, about setting some things in motion. This is, um, uh, I always, always like to show how interdisciplinary the team is here of the, when we worked on the Ford uh, River Rouge plant, another incredible, incredible, you know, honor. Um, and here the strategy was to um, interpret, again, those industrial processes already in place. In this, in this case, 
um, half of the rouge was active and about a third of it um, inactive. Um, uh, and to see how, uh, how to increase the productivity, both in, in the case of operational productivity, but also ecological. And in a way, what we were doing was helping William Clay Ford uh, set a course in action. You know, this is uh, two square miles, 1,200, uh, 1200 squ uh, square feet, two square miles of incredible factory, you can see, um, along the Rouge River, going to Detroit. Now that is a, that is, that is something. That is a churn and earn. So, but yet again, someone had to take some watercolor lessons. Oh my God, really, really? This is when I'm always reminded for people to please don't, don't take, don't say green as a verb. Don't use green as a verb. It's a horrible thing. So anyway, let's work with what's there. It's brown and it's orange, um, just the way in which Charles Sheeler painted the rouge. This is a drawing, this is a painting of the Rouge, where Henry Ford, how cool is Henry Ford, commissioned uh, Charles Sheeler and Diego Rivera um, to paint the Rouge and also photograph it. Um, an American icon, you know, so when they were asking to do an environmental assessment of uh, the Rouge plant, we insisted on doing a cultural assessment because we had I'm going to quote this guy. What was his name? He was so funny because he would be, I'd say, and there were incredible Albert Kahn buildings, like the industrial architect of all time, clad, you know, completely closed and clad. And I'd be like, dude, what about the glass plant? And he goes, it, you know, it's like slated to come down. And he goes, it, it's inactive. <laughs> and I'd be like, uh, what about the Coke ovens? They're inactive. I was like, oh my God. And so no discussion about how important these buildings are as, as a part of the American history. I mean, come on, you guys. The first integrated manufacturing uh, uh, factory in the world, um, as depicted beautifully. I hope you guys go to Detroit and see these by uh, Diego Rivera. Um, and this is uh, one of Dirt's uh, palettes. Uh, but it's a social and cultural palette, and uh, about the Battle of the Overpass. Whoops, whoops. Uh, the Battle of the Overpass here and labor um, switched to uh, manufacturing planes during the war. And guess who this badass chick is? Bonnie. That's Bonnie. Yes, she drove a Model T. Um, so um, here is a, a very early sketch, like just arriving with an idea about how we might, along this major corridor, um, take down all the berms that they did in the 1970s. They went into hiding. Note, 1970, environmental regulations. They went into hiding. They clad all the buildings. Millions of people used to come through here um, on tours, and they shut it down. So an idea here about opening up as industrial uh, gardens. Um, I used to call it, instead of a drive-through museum, a drive-by museum. So sorry, Bonnie, Bonnie got a hold of me. Um, and just again, to celebrate the scale you know, of this place. I'm right in the, uh, on the water treatment plant. Over here is the BOF, uh, the basic oxygen furnace. That's a huge freighter coming up from uh, upper uh, Minnesota for um, iron ore, and this, these are the iron ore bins, um, and these are the coke ovens that I'm going to show you, which was the focus of the dirt work. Um, I didn't want the cre clean green stuff. So we created a narrative, this is Miller Road now running north-south in that other sketch of, you know, McDonough working on the future um, assembly building, biggest green roof in North America. Um, and then the Miller Road corridor. Um, and then here, the, the past represented about with the regenerative gardens associated with the Coke ovens. Uh, and here are the Coke ovens. Um, uh, the chief um, of environmental uh, department's nightmare, I 
better get moving here. I'm telling too many stories. Um, but again, just infused with human energy, I found these clogs on the top of the Coke ovens because the, um, the workers strapped them to their boots or else the soles of their boots would melt. Um, and this, again, again, is where we had to do our homework, how to spatialize this. This is what they show, you know, we found was the coking operation. So what does that mean? How do you figure out what's hot and what's not? What to, ha what to remove carefully um, or, uh, or not? Um, I worked with a phytoremediation um, uh, specialist. And what we did is we took him out of his laboratory down in a basement and we made these remediation plots and whole uh, fields um, right along the um, uh, coke oven batteries. So there he is doing the demonstration gardens, visible right from Miller Road. Um, so uh, folks could come and be educated about phytoremediation. Um, here it is, sadly, today. Um, but it sure got a lot of play by Ford uh, in terms of uh, their uh, sustainability agenda. Po uh, this is uh, a project in Boston. Um, I'm not supposed to tell, but my, by my alma mater. Um, and here is Alston, a beautiful working town. Um, and this is the this is the uh, plan for um, Harvard's expansion over to this working class uh, neighborhood. Um, I want you to note here, um, again, it's this part of this site forensics, this big footprint and that curve. Only one thing could make that curve. And this is a plan by a mentor and who obviously likes street trees. Um, and this is the homework done uh, because they were going to be excavating for so many, so many buildings. So this is me looking at, um, at each one of the uh, boreholes, what was the quality of um, material under there. And what we found out is actually we had the perfect ingredients for good, good soil, uh, but we had to mix it, uh, mix it up. So there we go is that this was a whole menu of what it is that we could um, do with all the materials that was, were being excavated. Um, we showed this to the uh, client and they gasped because uh, this was actually the amount of material that was going to ramble through the neighborhood. This is times 100, all of these trucks. Um, and this is the neighborhood it was going to be um, uh, rambling by. Uh, so what we, uh, what we proposed was the dirt dance. Um, so the idea would be that all of this excavation would come to what I was showing, that big footprint, which is uh, the Sears, uh, an old Sears manufacturing, which we now call the, so the soil manufacturing and asphalt batch plant. We didn't know if Sears would appreciate it, but we just went ahead and called it that. But we were maximizing, you know, the, the loop um, within the site and maybe uh, some export but port, but that, that could go to some other property that Harvard owns. So there it was. This was a perfect slab because you can't mix soil on the ground. They have to put an expensive liner. So this slab was the perfect place to mix the soil. And again, lo and behold, right next to it, the rail line was still there. So instead of trucks rambling through the neighborhood, we proposed there was a truck road um, alternative, but what we were talking about is using a rail spur to come down and um, uh, haul all that dirt to the dirt factory because it was primarily coming out of the ball fields uh, that were sinking because they were on an oxbow. And the idea was that this would become uh, a linear park for the neighborhood. And while the dirt was being made um, right next to the neighborhood, we just showed it being made, because who doesn't love a bulldozer? Um, this project, another incredible um, collaboration uh, with artists and scientists, um, post-K, as they say, post-Katrina. But as Mel Chen uh, talked about, is that there was a disaster before the disaster. And that's this layer. 
under here. And what that disaster is is lead, leaded soils. Second highest lead levels um, uh, in the United States and uh, um, also highest um, lead poisoning rate of children there. Note this is when you need to know your statistics. Um, the EPAs, um, our EPAs tolerance level, you know, for um, lead content is 400 parts per million. You can see there was a lot more over that. Um, and it's interesting to note in uh, countries like Norway, uh, the limit is 40, uh, because Dr. Milkey found that over 100 parts per million, there was, uh, it could ca cause um, brain damage and other health problems in children. So that says a lot about our standards in this country. Um, and we're all familiar with these images of, um, of New Orleans and of buildings, but there was also the ground that was exposed. And with x-ray vision, we know that there was probably something underneath it. So in comes Mel. This is so funny he did this. Um, and uh, we, he invented Operation Pay Dirt. One component of it would be uh, clean and covert called the Fundred uh, Dollar Bill. And then he called me um, uh, in to say, if I raise the money, if we raise the money, um, what's the operation uh, to put it in? So he did a, um, uh, with art, the children that were cast all over the United States after Katrina, he made up a um, art lesson where the students would uh, draw their own hundred dollar bill um, and they were collected in vaults across the United States and they're on their way to Congress for a fair exchange of real cash to deal with um, uh, the lead situation. Pretty damn brilliant. So meanwhile, we were working with both Howard Milkey and the toxicologist and also Andrew Hunt on a, uh, uh, lead, by the way, never goes away. Sunflowers don't work. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but sunflowers don't work. Um, so, but lead can be locked. It can be rendered non-bioavailable by, uh, by adding phosphate. Um, and it becomes um, pyromorphite. Again, it, that locks the lead and it no longer is bioavailable. Um, so our strategy of TLC would be to treat it with the phosphate amendment. We did add six inches of, of clean sediment uh, so that it would be a good medium for now planting healthy vegetation trees uh, since um, New Orleans uh, lost, I think it was 60, 75 percent of uh, their um, uh, canopy cover. Um, and that's um, typical there. Oh, the sediment, or they called it sugar, isn't that sweet? The sugar would come from the Bonnet Carey uh, spillway here. You could see when it, it was actually just open recently, but like 90, 900,000 tons of, of clean sediment uh, gets released into here. And our idea was that it could be preferably by barge brought in uh, to um, the different areas. We calculated how many um, cubic yards would be needed. Um, the, 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 um, the head of NORA, the New, Ar uh, New Orleans Redevelopment Authority, was an engineer, so she was very impressed by this. We won a lot of points by running these numbers. But they all went to all the different, uh, different amounts, different neighborhoods, depending on what was needed. And the strategy was a multi-scale citywide, uh, depending again at the level of, levels of lead. Um, but it became a whole network of distribution. Um, so you can see it can, went from extra large to extra small. So at the mud depots, um, this would be, you could see the stockpiling, and it was the, at the scale of a truck. Oops, sorry, I'm having trouble with these. Uh, and then uh, within the neighborhoods, this would be uh, a mud square um, at this scale, the scale of the wheelbarrow, where people could get their soil uh, tested. And then there's extra small at the scale of the yard, where the big mud crew, um, a whole new job, uh, job uh, job workforce uh, um, uh, trained uh, to deal with the leaded soils and plant uh, would be operating. 
Okay, part three. Uh, I know I'm going long, so bear with me. Um, so it's okay. So um, uh, you know, a lot of talk has been about um, uh, about these urban voids or Turan Vogue. Um, you know, of course, uh, made vivid by Vim Vendors in um, films like uh, Wings of Desire. Um, and again, um, I bring up Smithson in terms of, again, that power of finding or of looking. Um, and you can see what he is talking about is the power of the glance, um, of not necessarily, again, of having to make things. And in addition to this, his skilled, with his skilled eye and skilled mind, he wrote, nature is indifferent to any formal ideal. And then also, meanwhile, scientists are, are making this argument right for novel ecosystems that, you know, turkeys will go anywhere. I mean, really, you know, nature, you know, wildlife, they don't need, they don't know the difference between a circle or square or a curve. Um, and that the novel ecosystems actually um, offer a more realistic and comprehensive strategy uh, for um, ecological restoration and that these habitats are actually a part, not a problem, they're a part of a healthy urban um, uh, ecosystem. Um, I don't really think that we need another type of urbanism, but um, I couldn't help call all actually my seminar wild urbanism. Yes, it's a poke at landscape urbanism. Um, but here's the quandary and the quest I, I have is to le legitimize these cast off sites and to adopt, that we could ad adopt these orphan landscapes um, for a new image of the city. And I think it is time to craft a new identity. That's what they talk a lot about in Detroit is identity, identity, identity. Um, and uh, to not have the shrinking cities apologize um, and instead uh, really um, put forward an optimistic view of their future. Again, we could take Berlin. This is kind of a funny picture of Berlin, but take Berlin, for example, with the uh, city actually sanctioning squatting uh, by a generation of urban pioneers. Um, great book, by the way, Urban Pioneers. Um, and they're occupation forms a place for you know this this prevent these provisional circumstances that in some cases become uh, very uh, endear you know uh, endearing and valued places this is uh, um, the uh, Sugalanda uh, nature park and I would ask what's the role of the designer you know in parks like these again I would say it's being a curator um, working with a lot of uh, restraint. Um, so it's not, I don't think, uh, design with a capital D. Um, and it, uh, but this doesn't, this doesn't mean that you're not making very precise decisions. Um, and that it just simply suggests finding the form, uh, a landscape that's growing on, on its own terms. So in a project that we worked on finding uh, the formless, it's Hardburger Park. Um, it's down north of downtown San Antonio. Um, uh, it's really was fantastic. It was at the meeting of five eco regions um, of Texas, so incredibly rich landscape. Um, but it's a tangle. Um, it's a post in, uh, post industrial, post agricultural uh, landscape. Uh, owned by Minnie and Max Volker. Minnie and Max, I mean, who, who, who knew? So anyway, fantastic. They, they held on stubbornly to 300 acres. Um, and this is what you would find is this second growth and these heritage oaks. Um, like I said, uh, over 300 um, miles, uh, 300 acres, uh, just, you know, jam-packed around uh, development. And what most people thought was a wilderness, even though it was like a post-agricultural wilderness. An idea for us came to, to explain an idea um, about a park that could be remain somewhat wild, but also be recognizable in a way as a, a, a rec, you know, some recognizable piece of their culture um, was the mission uh, 
uh, that we show here, and we began to term the, uh, the park a cultivated wild. Um, and a lot of it, again, it was called Volker Park at first. A lot of it, again, was teaching what to look for. So ra even before we designed the park, um, the park was open every second Saturday with uh, members of the design team, wildlife biologists, all actually a lot of, of locals, of course. We always work with local expertise, um, teaching folks what it is that they were looking for because it was subtle. I mean, there's subtleties in this landscape that they had to learn about so, they would be, so that they would understand the subtlety with which we are trying to work. Um, uh, and here, I wish I had our competition entry because it was the most formalist piece of junk in the world until we really began to understand the site and, I don't know, come up with a plan that I never would have thought I'd ever draw in my life. It's totally cuckoo, but um, it makes sense with the site. Um, uh, and again, being patiently showing them that this is what they have and this is what they could have with the very uh, kind of like the onslaught of water that they get every so often. Um, strategies for each layer of agriculture down to the context. Um, and really kind of the, the primary concept here, like kind of dumb as dirt. Um, and that is the restoration, you know, um, or, you know, uh, preservation, all sorts of strategies for the larger landscape mosaic. And then very judiciously, uh, this idea of more, uh, more of these kind of cultivated rooms. So, in fact, what happened is we made, oh, believe me, we had to back down the soccer associations, the baseball people, da da da, who wanted to fill this with um, uh, baseball fields. We put baseball fields and showed how much of this mosaic it would wipe out. And sure enough, they put me up in front of everybody when we made this pact. Um, I thought eggs were going to go flying towards me, and instead it was a huge round of applause that 75% of the park was going to be the landscape mosaic and 25% would be for cultural kind of passive but also active but not organized uh, sports. The parks department loved us. That meant their budget, their maintenance budget was right, not 100%. It was, you know, some percentage of the 75% and um, larger um, or more like their other parks for 25%. The, the community held us to every square inch of this promise. Whoops. Be careful what you promise. So here it is. You do really simple things. You find these three, who we call the three sisters, and you just clear out. There they are. Um, and here's one of the bee lines, and we just called one of these the trail and tree encounter. This is native limestone, and just set a trail to go around and say hello to the three sisters. Careful, 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 careful. Stay in the oaks and stay in the oaks. And look over, my friend Steve Stimson, my collaborator, look over this incredible um, limestone karst landscape. And last, um, uh, last, um, but very not least uh, project that I hate to talk about, but I love to talk about. Um, I have very much a love-hate with the High Line. Um, in that, uh, um, well, the team I was on got second, which usually me in the competition, which means it's usually the best. Of them. Anyway. But the biggest problem was that a genuine urban wilderness was lost in New York. A genuine urban wilderness. And I just lament that to this day. I go up there and unfortunately I saw what was up there before and I just want to break down and cry. And I, w I wondered why it was that, what happened? Why didn't we, why didn't they understand that or why didn't they go along as they said they were going to do of loving on this landscape? And as you guys might know, you probably all have been there because it's so popular. It's a mile and a third 
along the west side, goes through buildings, elevated 30 feet in the air. It's quite incredible. It's incredible history, right, of transporting uh, meat through the meatpacking district. Um, and there it is, um, growing in all its glory, um, according what we were saying, uh, what we said in our book was demonstrating its own ecologic, ecological logic without aesthetic meddling, that it draws life and purpose from what exists. That's what the high line was, photographed by Joel Sanders. Here's our team that day, um, practically slitting our fingers, doing a blood pack that we would work with the high line exactly as is. And that really all we wanted to do with the high line was simply reveal it for what it was. Um, manic drawings about taking the um, $100 million uh, dollars, um, and actually using some restraint and doing just, just enough to have folks access that wilderness. Um, and how it is that we are trying to talk to the Friends of the High Line and the planning department about learning the language of the landscape. Um, and how it is, again, you could just uh, stay away and off of the High Line um, to have that quiet experience because the Hudson River Park, which was cr is crazy, full of bikes, et cetera, is one block away. Um, to try to teach them about the subtleties of what was going on there and that it was okay to leave this landscape to chance. Um, and that again, um, inspired by Joel, jo Joel Sternfeld, we had um, a group of, of seed gatherers because that was a very, up there you couldn't use your ordinary ornamental seeds, right, that you can buy from Burpee. Um, this was a, a very specific seed bank because of, you know, the, seed, the plants that were growing up out of probably seeds brought in by um, ship ballast. Uh, so they had a very specific genetic makeup. So the idea was to kind of keep the, the high line going instead of, you know, separating environmental change uh, uh, and human action, that those would be a continuous loop. Um, the, and that again, it would be as simple as uh, gaining access um, and that the idea was just a meander, just a very, very simple walkway. And so, you know, instead of this, you get this. So, you tell me. Um, and this is a drawing that I did um, pretty early on. Uh, when I was um, worried about what was going to happen to the High Line. Yep. And for me, what really burns my ass is um, how resources are distributed here. Um, the High Line, take, uh, they spend $1.5 million to maintain the High Line every year. Um, a, a normal New York park, a uh, regular New York park um, is allocated $9,000 a year uh, for that size for, um, oh boy. Um, so, uh, luckily in the last section they ran out of money. Um, so, but in fact they completely took up the, all of this and put back a facsimile of um, of wildness, and as you can see, and I was very frustrated when I went there, that there's a handrail and you cannot touch the wilderness. Please don't touch the wilderness. So anyway, um, I do want to end by urging um, you all to be brave enough to encourage a community to embrace their fallow land, um, good, bad, and ugly, and to face the fact that they probably can't afford a watercolor master plan, and they, that they could live well with a well-grounded action plan and a course of action that focused on building of what they do have while showing them a way to channel the resources toward what they deserve. It's time for us to help communities um, to see the potential 
in the pile of weeds. It's a stretch now, but I think we could do it if we are persistent, remain inspired, and inspire some others if we stay grounded. I believe it's time for us to become guides into a frontier of urban landscapes that re re um, represent the future of our cities. It's time to operate with optimism that these kids have, that these kids say, I can find a way to be, to be resourceful. I know what we can do to set good things in motion. I found it and I can make something of it. Thanks. Thanks a ton, Julie. Yeah. Thank you for that. I didn't take you too long. Awesome lineage. Are there any questions? Comments. <laughs> Airing of grievances. <laughs> We've got time for some. I know there's some good questions in the. Well, I. Hi, Malcolm. Hi, Hi, Malcolm. Hi. I wanted to ask, what about New Jersey? What about New Jersey? This? Well, I'm a native too. So um, I just wonder if, if you think being a native garden stater started this. Oh, this totally started it. Oh, I, 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 think that, I think that I, I think I grew up thinking this was the landscape. You know, I mean, I, well, I grew up near the woods. Maybe that's why I have those pictures of the kids. But um, my father was a plastic salesman. How cliche is that? Uh, and we drove along the New Jersey Turnpike, and I was actually really always fascinated by those landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, I also remember, um, well, you know, it's pretty vivid memories of going to school in Pittsburgh, you know, and really, again, falling in with those, falling in love with those landscapes, and then again, being so influenced by Smithson, you know, and looking at, you know, those were the type of landscapes that. Um, I wanted to engage. I mean, other folks could have the pretty ones. And, and just to follow up, um, out of curiosity, uh, do you admire Brooklyn Bridge Park more than the High Line? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I think that Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, I think that uh, MVBA uh, did a combination of, of carefully curating that landscape you know, um, you know, the piers aren't gone, you know, uh, they're still there. They used uh, um, a lot of the buildings that had to come down. The wood is incorporated in there. Um, they are not afraid of form at all. Um, I'm not either, but m maybe there are moments that are, mm, maybe I should take that back. Sometimes the work be can become kind of self-conscious you know, a little rendered. But I think for the most part, um, what I love about, about Brooklyn Bridge Park and what I've learned from Michael Van Volkenberg is, is this power of immersion. Like when you go now, um, uh, it's a subtle detail, right? But they set the fences, you know, in, in a ways and planted really close to the trails. So right now, when you go, you are like embedded. You know, you don't see fences, you don't, aren't told to behave. You know, you are just really in, you know, a, a, a wild, a wild experience. So yes, I think it's very successful. Yes, uh, another question. Uh, I enjoyed the lecture, it was a wonderful, wonderful talk. I was wondering, why do you stop at the industrial era? Why not go back to the native Indians? I don't know. I guess I need to. I don't know. That's a great question. So I usually, um, I usually in my teaching, maybe I'm not practicing what I preach, but I, uh, in my teaching, I, uh, and I was talking to students today, how important it is to um, show uh, a site's history from actually like geological time forward, because uh, unless we really can, can, can show that whole progression, it's, I think it's hard to kind of 
uh, speculate about the future. So, yes, I don't show it, but I should. Um, I think your work is really special and different. Warm. So, um, your work. <laughs> People could probably hear you. Yeah, your work's really special and different from the norm, and I'm wondering if you think that your clients are also a lot different from the norm. Very good question. Um, I, you know, what I didn't show of, of projects are um, the ones where I did quit and got, you know got fired. Uh, because there was a mismatch, you know. Um, so I showed ones where, you know, um, there was some simpatico. Um, I also, um, I've gotten better about seeking out folks, you know. Um, and I, what comes to mind is, with your question, is the calls I would get for fix-it jobs, you know, they were like, and I remember basically asking the question if they were willing to come out of the closet. I wouldn't get many return calls, you know, with that. But I really, I, 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 ha I realized I had to ask of them that they were willing to um, adopt, embrace a level of transparency, right? So, um, and a lot of times, uh, you know, basically, you know, a, a good part of the work, as you could probably see, is educating, you know, the client. Um, in the yellow and red flag crazy memo, um, that client, um, I was very close to, um, I don't like to say convince, um, educate and let him decide that keeping um, some of the contaminated materials on site, take, basically um, take it from where it was that he wanted to develop a building, but not take it off site, but remediate it on site. All right. So, um, and that was going to cost some money. Uh, but he was, the project is in very well-educated Cornell uh, uh, environs, um, which, right, PR is worth a lot. Um, but it was, a, you know, I have to say that is a, a phone call, that, a phone call from, from him um, was very disappointing. He called and he just said, Julie, I know you talked to me about this, but really, why should I do this? And I just had to say, you know what? It's your land. It's your decision. I just had to, I just had to let you know. My most famous, my, one of my most famous clients, I gotta tell you this story, is really great. I was working in New Orleans and with Global Green and it just happened to be where Brad was doing the project. And he really is good looking. Uh, so, you know, he, you know, he comes up to me and he's like, oh, I love dirt, dirt is so cool. Da, da, da. And I was like, well, do you know that, you know, we expo you know, we found that there's lead, you know, on the site. He's like, oh, yeah, no, that's part of the story. You know, we got to take care of that and blah, 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 you know, you know, and everything. So, so fast forward that they are having the big opening, you know, of the project. And we had laid out where, you know, all of the spots were. And they, they called us and they said, how should we lay out the opening? You know, what should go where? What shouldn't go where? Blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, only put people here and we're going to, we design the fence and yada, yada, yada. Where do they park Brad's trailer? And I, and I said, we knew he was hot, but now he really is. <laughs> he was on the hottest spot of the site. So I said, don't lick it. We got asked to leave that project. I might try to. Um... Yes, um, I have a question about the High Line, your yes. proposal for the High Line. Yes. 
When you were thinking about the plant, the species palette, yeah. were you thinking that you would just work with what was there, mm -hmm. which would include mostly exotics and invasives, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was, where do you come down on that? On that? I mean, that's yeah. probably another lecture, but. No, no, no. <laughs> I, um, no, I, I, sh I should say that we plan to be, you know, strategic about that, right? Um, because some exotic, you know, exotic um, invasives would wreak havoc with the adjacent parks, right? So those were gonna, like, go away, you know, and we would, we would allow, you know, a lot of the other, you know, uh, non-natives who play a little bit more friendly um, to, uh, to hang out, but yes. But I am not a native lover. But um, so anyway, the work you know, as you probably know, the work, the work on spontaneous vegetation is just, just you know, it's going, it's just going gangbusters. If you guys don't know the, the work of Peter Del Tredici, you should look up his work. He's done a, one of spontaneous vegetation of the Northeast. Um, I think some of it, you know, would apply here. Uh, but it's, um, it's just going to be an amazing, Peter Del Tredici, uh, PDT, P Peter, D-E-L, last name T-R-E-D-I-C-I, -I, Del Tredici. He was senior scientist at the Harvard Arnold Arboretum, and he still teaches at the GSD. Um, and PDT is just the coolest. Um, and uh, he's won one of, of pioneers in Germany is way ahead of us in terms of, of this idea of novel ecosystems. But in terms of where we are, in terms of what we can afford, in terms of management and maintenance regimes, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna need to learn um, that, whole, that whole world of vegetation. So. Yes? Well, okay, we've got one more, awesome. Yes. What are we making now that's going to be cool when it's laying in ruins? I don't know. We better design some good stuff, right? I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's, I, I don't know. All I can do is flash back to this idea of being conscious of, of evolution, you know, of, of thinking, you know, along, the, along those lines. Um, about uh, when we fast forward, um, what it would be. I don't know. I've always thought that I have to go to more of those movies. Do you know those movies? You know, where it's like, you know, I don't know, with people like Will Smith and, you know, those movies. You know, that show, you know, what the Earth's going to look like. You know? And um, I don't know. Maybe it's going to look like what they show. It's, you know, just going to live in spontaneous vegetation. I, so, I don't know. Good question. And the other thing I should say is, right when you said that, I... This is a weird thing to say, too. It dated you. Because uh, in it, when I've been working on these projects, a lot... Like, I will go to... I work a lot with mayors, and I go to the Mayor's Institute, and... They use the word blight. I mean, you look up any city website and they say blight. You know, they don't say cool. They don't say cool, you know. So it's very, you know, so I, I actually have been working with my students very consciously to adopt a different vocabulary. You know, they're actually not allowed to say vacant in my studio. They have to say fallow. Abandoned, it's not abandoned, it's available. You know? 
I always say, turn that frown upside down, you know. No, seriously, I mean, uh, until, until we talk to them about what they have as a resource, you know, it's, it's going to be a Debbie Downer, you know, and words are, are very, you know, very important. I've, I've corrected mayors, you know, or, or I'm sorry, I pulled the jeopardy. I put in the form of this uh, question. You know, I'd say, you, you know, what do you think it means to call it blight? You know, what message are you sending? You know, and oh, in a lot of ways, you know, I've been working in Detroit. They're like, well, that's what it is, and then they say demolition, and then you ask, okay, but what's an after the demolition? You know, demolition is represented then of like removal and the end. You know, so it's like there needs to be words that are just more, more about cycles. Just more about cycles. So we can remain goddamn 